Sure, so Unseen is an anti-slavery organisation, we're a non-governmental organisation and our mission is to work towards a world without slavery. Cool. And we do this in three ways. We say we try to equip, support and influence. So when we talk about equipping, uh, we do a lot of frontline training of um, frontline professionals to understand and spot the signs and indicators of slavery and trafficking and to know how to respond. Um, when we talk about support, we are talking about our direct services to survivors. So we run a women's safe house, a men's safe house and also a resettlement service. So the safe houses are 24-7 and then once people move out of there we then help resettle them into the community and can work with them for a bit longer whilst they're living in and around the southwest. Um, we are due to open a children's project later this year, so again a, um, a safe house for children. Um, and then we say by influencing we uh, realise that as an agency on our own we can't tackle this issue so that we need to collaborate with law enforcement, with government, local, national, with the EU, uh, with law enforcement agencies, with local authorities, other statutory agencies to make sure that we come together um, and work out kind of which bits each agency needs to do so that we can try and tackle and prevent the issue from even occurring in the first place. So I think we appreciate our support side as a bit of a sticking plaster. Mm. So the issue has already occurred for people yeah. um, and you need to then kind of try and help put people back together again and get them back to resilience and empowerment and independence. And we do a very small part of that on, our, kind of on their journey. Um, but ideally we want to work to a situation where we don't even have to have safe houses anymore because actually the issue isn't occurring. Um, so quite a lot of the work we do in our collaboration is working with businesses to look at their supply chains and to understand where it may be occurring in their supply chains and then start unpicking some of that. Um, so again, that kind of preventative strand to ensure that in 25 years time I don't retire going woohoo! 25 safe houses you want to kind of retire going you know what we actually were able to shut safe houses because we don't need them anymore because the general public uh, statutory agencies the government actually did enough and recognized it was an issue and then changed kind of the way that we approach the issue so that's our kind of overall aim I suppose to do ourselves out of business oh, um, awesome the other thing we do is run a helpline so we've taken over the National um, Modern Slavery Helpline and that is a 24-7 helpline that anyone from law enforcement, frontline agencies, statutory agencies and members of the public or potential victims themselves can call um, and get help. Yeah, I think, I mean, there are, I can probably give you a few indicators you could look for um, with the caveat of exploitation and abuse takes many, many forms. Um, so you won't always be able to tick off every single indicator. But I think also with the caveat of um, lots of law enforcement agencies know bits of the picture. And actually, if you have a concern, it's far better to call that in to the Modern Slavery Helpline and they can share that information with the relevant agencies. So I think my advice would be, even if you're concerned and you don't quite know what you're concerned about, I'd still call it in and let somebody make that decision for you, or at least in discussion with you. So I think general indicators, if you're thinking about people, you could look at um, the behaviour of people. Um, kind of whether people are withdrawn or scared or not willing to speak to you, if they're serving you in some form or if they don't speak English, if they don't understand what you're asking in a service industry. Um, you might look for their appearance. Are they unkempt? Do they look like they have access to hygiene facilities? Do they look like their clothes have never been kind of washed or cleaned? Are they old? Um, things like inappropriate clothing for a work environment. So we see slavery occurring in the UK in the car wash industry, in the agricultural industry, in the hospitality industry, uh, in the construction sector. Are the people that are working in those industries suitably clothed? Do they have the right work equipment? Um, are people nervous of the authorities? Again, as a member of the public, that might be hard to tell whether someone is nervous of the authorities or not. Um, some people might be living in overcrowded accommodation, um, so we find that people are usually uh, put in kind of incredibly dirty and cramped conditions with often no sanitation. <coughs> Excuse me. So low sanitation, um, lots of people coming and going from one house. Um, times of travel is always interesting. It's that kind of, oh, I always see a van turning up to number 75 and four people all kind of get out and then 12 people get in and they arrive at six o'clock in the morning and then they come back at midnight. So that kind of unusual travel times, unusual numbers of people coming and going from a property. Um, and I think that indicates potentially the lack of freedom that somebody has and also that control over somebody um, that can, someone's picking them up and taking them to and from work. Um, and controlling their movements, which in a UK society most of us are free to kind of get up and go to work. We don't need someone to kind of come and pick us up en masse, etc, etc. 
So slavery is definitely a global phenomenon mm. and I think what we see is if you can't get things done cheaply here, you can get them done cheaply somewhere else. So I do think there is something about how uh, realising that kind of inextricable link to yeah. what we want here and do here has a knock-on effect down the supply chain. And I think for um, the UK market or someone living in the West, it's really hard to see the T-shirt that you're buying for £3, that realisation that can that ever actually have been made for £3 by the time you have paid someone's salary, by the time you have then shipped it to the UK, by the time you've put it onto the shelf, etc, etc. And I think we have probably lost the understanding of what things cost. Um, and I think the hardest thing for me with slavery is that realisation that each and every one of us are linked to this issue because of the things we choose to buy, so technology, clothing, um, even if you purchase sex, the services that we engage with. We want our nails painted, we want beauty kind of products, we want our cars washed. Uh, so cheap kind of sex, cheap labour, cheap services, we are all inextricably linked to that because we purchase those things. And I think that for me is one of the main issues with slavery is that kind of how do we get the community and the general public to realise that actually we are inextricably involved in this just because we don't see it kind of when we're necessarily walking down the street. Um, actually it's happening and the, the items and the products that are being produced are finding themselves onto the shelves in the shops that we shop in. And I think it takes us to stop and think, hang on a minute, how can that only cost this much? Or at what point during that supply of that is somebody being exploited? Um, and it is happening kind of all around us. There has been a proliferation in car washes, a proliferation in nail bars. You can walk down a high street and see both of those things. Um, and I would challenge anyone who thinks people are being paid fairly if they think a five pound car wash can, can then pay someone's salary. I think my personal drive in this is, um, hmm, it's a really good question. I would say, I get really frustrated by injustice and I learnt about this issue when I was working in a Ukrainian orphanage um, and I was chatting to a little boy that I had been working with via a translator and I learnt that he and his mum had been walking down a street one day and a car had pulled up and two guys had got out of the car and kind of flanked his mum and the third guy had taken him for an ice cream and as he looked around his mum was being bundled into the car and that was the last time he ever saw her. Now at that time I hadn't really engaged with the issue of trafficking, I didn't really understand what slavery was. At the time slavery wasn't even a term, we're talking 2008, so it was all about sexual exploitation and violence against women. Trafficking was known as a thing about against women and girls. And it just really stuck with me that this little guy I was working with in an orphanage kind of had had his mother taken away from him to goodness knows what, and there he was, and his life was now going to be kind of under this state system um, of an ex-communist country that wasn't going to be great. And that just kind of, there was an injustice there that then made me kind of go, right, I need to look into this. And the more I learnt about it, the more I became horrified that humans were treating each other like this. That kind of commodification of people um, for the purpose of making more money. And I think the more I learnt, the more I couldn't believe that people were doing this to each other. And yet, the more it was obvious that it was. And then, where was my connection with that? And what was I doing that might help proliferate that? And I just think it was that moment of learning about an issue that I found so unbelievably horrific that I felt I needed to do something. Um, so we decided to start Unseen and set up, the first thing we wanted to do was set up safe housing. And I think naively we just thought, oh, okay, we'll just set up a safe house. And now what we realise is that kind of collaboration and influence and if we want to work to challenge the system and to tackle it completely, we can't just do safe housing. Um, and we say now we kind of try and take the voice of the survivor to the people that can then make the policy. So it's that micro to macro to make sure that that voice of the people who've actually, actually experienced this gets heard because I can talk about it and I can articulate it but I haven't been trafficked therefore my story yeah this is why I'm here but at the same time you can't powerfully tell those stories so it's giving the people who have been exploited and haven't had a voice a voice to make sure that that gets heard um, and then that influence policy because actually the guys sitting at Whitehall and in government kind of make policies based on oh we think this is a good idea so we feel it's our job to make sure that connection is there for them so if they do want to come and visit and understand what's going on on the ground they can do and then hopefully that will influence the changes that they make knowing that actually remembering oh we did meet that survivor once and that's what they told us rather than just kind of oh we've got a blank piece of paper what are we going to do 
So it's a bit of a, a waffly answer, but I think kind of my desire to help people and my absolute horror at injustice and the way that people were treating other people, I think is kind of what drives me. Um, and then seeing, I suppose, our staff teams doing such amazing jobs with people who are absolutely spiralling out of control and free falling and everything in their life has been completely obliterated and watching our incredibly skilled teams working 24-7 in such a dedicated way to get those people back onto an even keel and to help them reach independence and I think that's what I love about Unseen and the teams is that we don't we, we know what part we need to play and that part isn't to hold on to a survivor forever. It's to celebrate when they're ready to step out on their own and it's to celebrate when they've reached a position of independence and resilience and can continue as their life on their life journey without a label of being trafficked. And I think I'm so proud of everything the staff do to facilitate that and I think that's really, really special at Unseen.